Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the, uh, what day is today? The April 20th, 2015, uh, regularly scheduled meeting of the Finance Committee of the Lake Forest City Council. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Schoenheider. Here. Chairman Panaleon. <clears throat> Here. Alderman Waldeck. Here. Alderman Beidler. Here. Alderman Moore. Here. Alderman Reisenberg. Here. Alderman Tack. Here. Alderman Edelman. Here. Alderman Moreno. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. <clears throat> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, the second item on our agenda is consideration of minutes from the Finance Committee meeting held on March 9th, 2015. Are there any uh, edits or corrections or comments on that? Okay, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Um, I think that was seconded by Sorry, I know. <laughs> by, <laughs> by Alderman Beidler. Um, and uh, do I have a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Sorry, that was a little rocky. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, just an update on bond council services. <clears throat> um, and it says uh, Elizabeth Holub is going to present that, but I think I'll. Since she's got plenty to talk about later, I think I'll take take that one. Um, on uh, March 6th, I'm sorry, uh, we received, we issued requests for proposals in March. Um, we have used Cat and Muchen for bond council for the last dozen years or so. And uh, it just seemed that it was time to, uh, you know, refresh that. And uh, so a request for proposal was issued in March. Uh, there were nine or ten uh, responses, of which three stood out. Uh, Cat and Muchen, um, Chapman and Cutler, and uh, Miller Canfield, <coughs> all of which are very significant players in the bond market. Um, on uh, last Thursday evening, we had a uh, series of interviews with them. We uh, have reduced the recommendation or the, the group down to two, but we haven't come to a conclusion yet. Uh, we expect to bring, and this is a, a, a sort of a <coughs> committee made up of uh, me as uh, finance chair, the head of the legal committee, and uh, Bob Kiley and Elizabeth Holub. And um, we expect to have a recommendation. We, pr we sort of expect to formulate a recommendation later this week or early next week. and bring the recommendation forward at, uh, at our uh, city council meeting on May 4th. So uh, just an update there. Uh, next item on the agenda is now Elizabeth's chance to shine. Uh, at our March 9th budget meeting, a request was uh, made for an update on budget issues in general, uh, what's what we control here in the city, what we don't control, what uh, what the situation is with the state, uh, state and police and fire pensions. And uh, so Elizabeth is going to give us a primer on pensions. Thank you, Chairman Panaleon. Um, I know that the PowerPoint contains a lot of information. The PowerPoint was included in your packet. I hope that that will be a useful resource for you going forward. Um, I don't intend on going through everything today, but obviously anything that's of particular interest to you, please stop me, and, and I'm happy to elaborate. Um, but um, city employees that are eligible for a pension plan participate in one of three uh, pension plans. IMRF is the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, and those are all non-public safety employees. And then there's a police pension fund and a fire pension fund. Um, the IMRF plan is an agent multiple employer plan. It is administered at the state level. Each uh, employer has their own actuarial evaluation and their own contribution rate, but assets are all commingled um, and administered at, at the state level, not by the state, but a separate board um, that uh, works on, on the IMRF plans together as, as a joint uh, system. The police and fire pension plans in Illinois are single employer plans 
which means they're locally administered by a board um, that is determined locally. They are all three defined benefit plans. Uh, you have a defined benefit versus defined contribution pension plan. Defined benefit means that the benefit for retirees is based on a formula, years of service and age. Um, whereas defined contribution is that there is a particular contribution placed into the pension plan and the employee takes the risk of any investment losses. So um, all three are defined benefit <coughs> and structure. They all provide <coughs> retirement, disability, and death benefits. And then the participants, to give you an idea of the number of participants in each plan, we provided that information broken out between active vested, non-vested, <coughs> Uh, those that are vested but are deferred annuitants, um, and noting that um, the IMRF plan includes both library employees and school district 67 employees in our plan. So those three are all combined. The police plan has 36 current beneficiaries and the fire fund has 33 current beneficiaries uh, receiving benefits. Um, and one thing that's unique with IMRF is that once an employee retires from Lake Forest as an <coughs> IMRF participant, their assets are moved to another fund. They're taken out of the city's plan and moved to a separate compartment within the IMRF uh, accounting. And so you don't see retirees listed there because they're not in the city's plan anymore. Can I, a couple of questions on that chart, if sure. you wouldn't mind. Um, when it says vested and deferred, what does that mean? Um, vested and deferred means that the employee has met the requirement for years of service to have a benefit, but they have retired and aren't eligible for retiree benefits yet, so they are waiting to reach usually an age. Got it. Okay. So if I retired <clears throat> from the city at age 52, but and I was vested in the plan, entitled to benefits at that, calculated at that level, but not eligible to receive those benefits until 65, that would be? Or you may have elected not to begin drawing because you get a higher right. benefit <clears throat> if by waiting. Okay. What the is the best, excuse me. Go ahead. What is the vesting provision? Um, how many, how many that years? is on the next slide. It's eight oh. years for IMRF and police and 10 years for fire. Okay. How come district, the 115 isn't in here, but 67 is? Uh, it's related to the charter. <coughs> and because school district 67 is comes under the city's charter, they're included in our IMRF plan. But that's only, that's non-teaching employees, right? Correct. Because the teachers have a union. Right. So that's just uh, administrative Administrative, staff and okay. That was my other question. So okay. Thanks. <coughs> Um, next slide um, compares and contrasts some other aspects of the plans. Board membership um, at the statewide level, there are four uh, board members elected by IMRF employers. There are three board members elected by participants, and there is one annuitant. Um, so there's an eight member board that make the policy decisions for the statewide plan. Uh, police and fire both have two mayor appointees um, two active employees that are retired from within the participants in the fund, and one retiree elected by the retiree or beneficiaries. So in regards to local representation, IMRF has none unless in any particular situation there is an either uh, a board member um, that's an employer or participant. Currently there is no local representation on the IMRF board. And then there are two board appointees um, by the City Council for Police and Fire. Benefit determinations, all established by the Illinois General Assembly. They're in the statutes. The city has no control over benefits for any of the three plans. The city contributions for each plan are actuarially determined. The employee contribution for each plan, for IMRF, employees contribute 4.5% of their salary. They are also eligible for Social Security, so they also contribute 6.2% to FICA, so a total of 10.7%. Police and fire employees are not eligible for Social Security, um, and the police contribution for employees is 9.91% and 9.455% for fire. 
vesting. Um, I've indicated here the vesting and, and pension for tier one. We'll talk a little bit about tier two today, um, but because there are so few employees in these plans in tier two, um, we just provided the information for tier one, which is eight years vesting for IMRF and police, 10 years for fire. And then you can see the calculation for the maximum pension eligible under each plan and a 50% pension which is percentage of salary at a certain number of years of service and age. That 75%, uh, is that on the last year or the three-year average before they leave? Or They're all a little different. IMRF is the highest 48 months of 120, so the highest four years uh, out of the last 10. Um, and police and fire would have to check to be sure, but I think um, one is the last day. Police last day. Police is the last day, um, and fire last year. Um, Elizabeth, what determines the tier two? I know I've read something about this. It's it's a it's yeah, it happened at a point in time that. Mm -hmm. But does it, that mean that our <coughs> eligible IMRF uh, employees are now in tier two? So we're um, if you them. enter the pension, if you enter the pension plan on or after January first, two thousand eleven, you are in tier two. Okay, no matter what, if you're uh, eligible. Yes, for that plan. unless, for example, an IMRF. If you have years of service from another IMRF employer, it combines. Police and fire doesn't, unless you elect to take your money from one police or fire pension plan and move it to another. And when you say enter the plan, does that mean vest in the plan or does that mean? Begin employment. Just Start so job. the day you start, okay. Right. <clears throat> Do we oh, have, Elizabeth, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. Last day worked, does that include overtime? <clears throat> does that include unused vacation? And does that include any unused sick leave? For police and fire, no, for none. But and I had it does include longevity, so it's base salary plus their longevity. That's their pensionable okay. salary. And I had a similar question. Do we have any uh, uh, protections in place to make sure that somebody doesn't get a out of regular raise the last day or the last year or something? Because that, that type of stuff made the news a couple of years ago in Illinois. Um, the city manager approves all salary changes, so he... That there is a local ability to control that. Um, it, it's commonly referred to as pension spiking. Um, and some employers have um, increased salaries on the last day of employment to, to affect the pension calculation. Have we done that? We have not. Okay. We have not. And uh, all of our employees' salary is adjusted following the council's approval of the budget May 1, or effective May 1. And uh, anything different than that has to be approved by me. Any other questions on that slide? Elizabeth, how many, how many actual, so in, in our, um, our local police and fire, it's, it's our, our, our employees are the pool, mm -hmm. but IMRF is a huge pool. It's a huge how many, pool, how many but people are in that? Oh, statewide, I couldn't begin to tell okay. you, but okay. I will tell you that each employer is accounted for separately. Oh, so even though we have what, no representation. What Schomburg does does not affect the city of Lake Forest rate. If that is your question, it's each employer is looked at individually and has their own uh, determined contribution rate. But IMRF is also one of the best funded pension yeah. systems in the country, not Absolutely. just the state, but, right. but the country. Absolutely correct. Well, but the reason for that is that the municipalities are not allowed not to fund. Right. So just like corporations, they don't have a choice to not fund. So. So on IMRF, the contribution, the actuarial rate is determined specific to the municipality, but the investment return is commingled. Yes. I think that might be what um, we're getting Helpful. To. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's one of the benefits is by commingling those assets and having them administered at one level, you do reduce your fees for investment management, um, and you can um, 
certainly leverage very good professionals because it's such a large investment yep. pool. Yep. Can I add one more question on that? Um, tier two, mm -hmm. is that, that is a lower benefit program? Um, it, it, what it does is it increases the years required for vesting and extends the age for certain levels of pension. So you have to work longer to vest, you have to work longer to achieve the 50 and 75%. But it's not a defined contribution plan. It is not a defined contribution plan. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so investing, we've talked about investing. Um, I think that's an important aspect. Uh, this slide uh, relates only to police and fire. Um, but Article 3 and 4 of the Illinois State Statute set out the permitted investments for police and fire pension plans, and it sets limits on the type of investments that can be made as a percentage of net assets in the fund. I've got here the slide only for funds with net assets over $10 million, because in state statutes, they have differing limits on different size plans. So this kind of shows the evolution of um, entry into equity investments by the police and fire pension plans over time. Prior to January 1, 1998, um, they only had authority to invest in up to 10% of their net assets in non-fixed income investments. And they were limited to separate accounts of life insurance companies and separate accounts of insurance companies. And then in 2000, it was added to this category, qualified mutual funds. But still, overall, combined a 10% limit of assets. Um, there was a public act effective January 1st, 1998 that increased that. It kept the 10% limit on insurance contracts and qualified mutual funds, but it added 35% in combination of common and preferred stocks and mutual funds through an investment advisor. So then they had authority to go up to 45% in equities. And then the, the pension reform bill, Public Act 961495, <coughs> um, set out two um, benchmarks. One was effective July 1st, 2011, that went to 10 and 50, so it raised the total to 60% possible. And then effective July 1st, 2012, it went up to 65%. Um, and then also Public Act 961495 added qualified insurance, <coughs> qualified corporate bonds as another uh, type of investment with no limits. So over time, there has been an increasing <coughs> ability for the pension funds to invest in equities in their plan. But of course, that's locally administered. Each board makes their own decision on uh, investment allocation. And recipients, retirees, when they are fully vested and they receive funds, uh, how are they taxed? Are, 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 do they have exceptions under the uh, federal taxing authority? Not related to the investments underlying in the pension plan. Right, okay. No, they're, um, and the entity itself is tax exempt, so the pension plan is not paying any taxes on those investments as they go through. And what about the benefits that the employees receive? The benefits that the employees receive are taxed based on normal income, taxable income. Are, is this a good time to ask, or is there something coming about the guaranteed rate of return and the city's obligation? Later. Later. Okay. Yeah. I think we'll get to it, but remind me if I miss it. I I think we're gonna cover it on the next couple graphs. Lake Forest funded ratios. The funded ratio is, at any given point in time, the actuarial value of the assets in the plan divided by the actuarial accrued liability. So the actuary's projection today of what the liability is going forward into the future. Um, so this shows the change in the pension system funded ratios for each plan. Police is blue, IMRF is green, and fire is red. Um, and it goes back to 1999, and you can see that in 1999, both the fire and IMRF plans were 100% funded. Police was about 80%. And over time, as you've heard with all other, pen all other pension plans, the funded ratio has declined despite the fact that the city has continued to make the actuarial required contribution. That's due from a variety of factors. It's due from benefit changes at the state level. It's due from investment uh, returns year to year that fluctuate. 
Um, but um, and it also depends on the state statute at any given time related to the um, the funding period by which the liability has to be amortized. That has changed over time as well. So you can see where we stand as of 2014. We'll have results from the 2015 actual evaluation in July. Um, and then that will set the amounts for the 2015 levy for next year. Have the expected cash flows to satisfy retiree benefits changed significantly over this period? In other words, has the demographic of the population lengthened um, in age? so that more outflows should be expected? Yes, what we do is there, there's a mortality table that the actuary uses in their assumptions. And um, we're gonna have that on a future slide, but I think it was two years ago we adjusted it to a more current mortality table that reflected longevity and people living longer, receiving benefits for a longer period of time. Have they also reduced the assumed rate of return? Um, we have, um, the IMRF has not changed it, um, but um, police and fire was reduced from 75 to 7%. So the primary, but my understanding, the primary driver of these downward slopes is the increased benefits that have been granted. I mean, it's, these other things are a factor, but the big mover is the fact that our legislature has continued to increase benefits to municipal employees through the last 20 years and not required uh, fully funding that. So... And That's been a big driver. I would also just say in the 2008, this laser isn't. Yeah, there was anymore, little 2008, investment you see drops in them, 2008 and 2009. That was largely the investment losses. Right. Um, the drop in 2011 for the green line, which is IMRF, that drop between 2010 and 2011 was the IMRF uh, early retirement incentive program. So there are other factors, but yes, mm -hmm. um, benefit determinations and investment return or loss is significant drivers and why is police consistently you know 10 percent below or more below the other two um a lot of it may be an aspect of of their investment allocation their decision making about investments but you can see that overall the span between the two lines has stayed about the same mm -hmm. it's just that they started out 99 20 percent less funded than the other two plans and what is generally considered adequate funding? Um, adequate funding everyone level. has a different opinion on that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, our current actuary believes that 60% is reasonable, um, but there's literature that, that will say a variety of things. But I guess I had always gotten the sense that a number around 80% is sort of considered a good, a good thing to shoot for. Mm -hmm. but so so we're we're paying what we're supposed to pay and a shortfall is occurring <clears throat> whose problem is that eventually and how will that become a bill to ultimately whom? it's the city's problem because the city bears um, the responsibility for making sure that the fund is fully funded um, they don't have the authority to make the investments um, the state sets the employee contribution rate and the city is left with the difference and the benefit level and the benefit levels. Um, this shows, um, I think, a very interesting picture of the contribution requirements. A lot of times you hear, well, pensions have gotten into this trouble because they haven't met their contribution requirements. I would reiterate the city has consistently met the actuarially required contribution and in a lot of cases exceeded it. Um, but this um, graph shows the municipal pension contribution per eligible employee in each plan from 1999 through 2012. The reason why you see 2012 is because this is tax levy year driven, and the 2012 lex levy year was 2014 fiscal year. So it is current. There's just a two-year lag because of the timing on the levies. So in 1999, you can see again, green line IMRF, red and blue line, red is fire, blue is police. Um, and you can see where those contributions stood per employee 15 years ago versus where they are today, 35,000 per employee police, um, about 28,000 for fire, and about 12,000 um, in IMRF. That's a per employee 
contribution per year. And again, the police seems to be lagging. Um, you see police that? escalating at a higher rate because their funded ratio is lower. And so they are trying to amortize a larger unfunded liability each year, which is, which is exponentially increasing the contribution. If that makes sense, they're the I'm top one. I'm not seeing line. that on the, on the chart. It seems the, like the, the top one is the police. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the top one was IMRF. Okay. No. I did too. Yeah, colorblind. Yeah. Sorry. The blue and green didn't come out very well on this one. I apologize for that. I like blue for police and red for fire. That makes I sense. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Um, actuarial evaluation, so as mentioned earlier, um, we, the city makes the contribution to each pension plan based on an actuarially required contribution. Um, the city contracts annually for an actuarial evaluation of the police and fire pension funds. And then we talked about the two-year lag. So the results of the valuations on April 30th, 2014 determine the property tax levy requirements for the 2014 levy which is the amount in the FY16 budget. IMRF um, provides the employer contribution rates on a calendar year basis. So the 2013 calendar year actuary evaluation determines the contribution rate for the employers in calendar year 2015, which is the FY16 budget. So just talk a little bit about the timing. Um, we talked about Tier 2, Public Act 96-1495. It created a new tier of benefits for public safety employees. This looks only at police and fire on this slide. Um, but it also significantly changed employer contributions. Um, however, I think the city has wisely chosen to not take the changes from Public Act 96-1495 because it really results in a bigger problem down the road. So this just compares um, 96, 14, 95 by statute. Employers only need to have their police and fire pension plans 90% funded, target funding ratio is 90% by 2040. Um, the city has elected to maintain the previous legislation, which is 100% by 2033. Um, so those actuarial evaluations are what are built into the actuarial calculation. Also, the actuarial evaluation method was altered to projected unit credit under the new law, um, which will give you a reduced contribution now, but an increased contribution later. So the city's elected to stick with the prior legislation of entry age normal. So all in all of that, more conservative, funding at a higher level, and funding faster than required by state statute. Elizabeth, though, it seems pretty unreasonable that, that cities, municipalities that were, I mean, I'm delighted to know that we're not in that pool that, that's doing the PA 96, 14, 95, but it seems unreasonable if you're struggling to meet, you know, an obligation at 50% now or, or, you know, and I know there are municipalities that are lower than that, how are they going to get to 90? I mean, it compounds, right? I mean, right. this just gets to be, you know, I know we're all, and the, at some point these numbers are just so overwhelming, the billions of, you know, the combined problem for the state, which is so extraordinary, but it just seems completely unrealistic to, to think that there's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that we're playing our original plan and, and doing as well as we are. Uh, it's just how worried we need to be, which is probably pretty worried about what's happening statewide that, that can impact us, particularly when we have no control over it. Right. Well, I think, uh, <coughs> Alderman Beidler, I think that's one of the reasons why you hear Governor Rauner talking about whether city should be given the ability to file for bankruptcy yeah absolutely because um and elizabeth would be certainly wiser in this area than i but i've heard people say that there are some very large cities that they've gotten so far behind that mathematically they cannot they catch, catch up, up. Yeah. and they say all the right things publicly they say things about they're looking for the state to help bail them out but the reality is that unless there's going to be any major change in the system and way people earn benefits um, and are paid uh, those benefits, there's just no way that they can yeah. they can make it up. I mean, when you're down to 25, 30 uh, percent, it just can't happen. Yeah. One of the things that some plans have done when they get into those scary areas is 
rack, crank up their risk level and try to get higher returns. So, and you're seeing that with a, especially in a low return environment like we have right now, uh, you're, you're seeing a significant changes in investment allocations to things like, uh, you know, what are called alternatives, things like hedge funds, mm -hmm. uh, private equity, venture capital, um, you know, some types of real estate investing. Mm -hmm. And I have to, uh, to echo that. I, I'm very concerned about the allocation of fixed income for all the reasons that we all celebrate when we're issuing bonds. There should be a re severe reduction, in my view, in, in the, not the guideline, but in the parameters around the allocation between different types of funds. So alternatives certainly could be attractive, and there's lots of different flavors. Uh, but, but I, I am very concerned about the allocation to fixed income, which I don't know that we have any control over. Right. Well, if rates go up, value is lost. Significantly. And the, the rates aren't, even if the rates double from, say, one and a half to three percent, it's not going to help them very much on that side of the equation, and the value losses will be significant. So it, I, I assume that the managers are managing to that possibility, I'll, I'll say. Um, but I, I, the overall allocation of fixed income is what concerns me, because that's just it, it's too high or too low. Too high. Too high. But I'm. But it's safe. It's quote safe. Unquote. Yeah, you won't lose your principal, <laughs> but you won't make any money. Right. Well, you, you don't might make lose, any money. You might lose your principal if you're forced to sell. True. So. But this becomes an exacerbated overall trend if you're not making any money. But we're obligated to make up the difference. That's right. That's right. right. So it's so an unfunded there mandate. the problem, yeah. Yes. Yep. And I would also t say, too, that um, a lot of the investment managers that are investing for police and fire pension plans are holding more in cash. And they've been holding more in cash for several years, kind of anticipating that interest rate rise. It's going to come. It's going to come. Mm -hmm. But um, to, to kind of leverage against some of that, but you still have a, a significant amount of investments in fixed income securities. So. Um, this slide just uh, provides some numbers on the most current information for each plan. So for IMRF, it's the valuation date for calendar year 2013. And for police and fire, the most recent valuation of April 30th, 2014. You can see the actuarial value of the assets and the accrued liability. So again, the accrued liability is the actuary's estimate of the liability today for all benefits that are due in the future. Unfunded liability is simply the difference. Some staggering numbers, 12 million for IMRF, 20.6 million for police, 9.5 million for fire. Percent funded um, is simply the, the value of the assets divided by the liability, 73.9 for IMRF, 56.2 for police, and 76.3 for fire. Um, the assumed rate of return, that was asked already as far as what is the investment rate return assumption built into them. It is 7.5% for IMRF, 7% for police and fire. The investment return on the next line is that year's investment return. So in 13, mm -hmm. IMRF had 20.26%, 10.3 for police and 7.78 for fire. And then the next line is the five-year average return for each plan. So for IMRF, the five-year average is 14.37, 9.67 for police, 8.41 for fire. So in at least the, the last five years, they are meeting the assumed rate of return, um, which is good because a lot of people think you've got assumed rate of returns that are just unrealistic. You can't meet them, and so you're, you're rolling the liability down the hill. I have a question on that. Yeah. So do Don't I... I don't I remember a year where we had to make up the difference in the last five years? And that leads to my question of if they are averaging, say, uh, take the police, 9.67 on a 7% municipal guarantee, which is effectively what that house bill was, um, and we have a year where we're 6%, do we have to pay the difference that year? Or do we look at an average or? No, it is based on an average. And it's just, if you don't meet your investment return in a particular year, it just increases the unfunded liability that is then amortized over the remaining years to the funding target. So if you don't meet don't it, you fall short. The There's the no pay up. You don't have to make 
any particular payment in any year if your investment return falls below in that year. It just increases the liability and increases your contribution going forward. Like free heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, is the interest rate assumption used in the actuarial valuation mm-hmm. the same rate that is, that's shown here as the assumed rate of return? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that the same number that's sometimes referred to as the discount rate? In the pension plan? Um, the discount rate is a little different, That's for and calculating I would let the actuary benefits. explain that to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it isn't the same, and it is going to become important under GASB 67 and 68 because the farther apart your discount rate is from your assumed rate of return, it can impact the liability that's on your financial statements. So the goal is to achieve a discount rate as close to your assumed rate of return as possible. For net present value calculations. Okay. Is it possible to have a discount rate above? <clears throat> I guess it's anything's possible. It's possible, but not probably not, not sustainable. Likely. Probably not. Yeah. The other thing that I would mention here with these investment returns on the five-year average, we have to remember what we're looking at here before we get too comfortable. Thank you. I mean, this is a historic recovery from an incredibly deep low bottom, and. Um, so those percentages are, I think if you went out, went over a longer time frame going backwards, you'd see numbers, you know, much more in the 8% range uh, over a longer time horizon. And going forward, highly unlikely uh, that we'll see those kinds of returns going forward. If anything, there are a fair number of thought leaders in the financial world that would expect below average returns over the next, say, four or five years because of just you can't can't keep growing at 14% a year or 10% a year indefinitely. That that leads to another question that I I meant to ask earlier when we talked about uh, asset classes. Uh, What's the international allocation? Is there a limit in either bonds or equities? There isn't a limit. Within those limitations we saw on the earlier slide, each pension board can determine their allocations within that to large cap, small cap, international, those components. Thank you. Um, The next uh, line is the tax levy requirement for the police and fire because that's how we get our required contribution from the actuary is a specific dollar amount that's included in the tax levy the following year. Um, The IMRF is a determined rate, and so the actuary actuary for IMRF determines the employer rate for each employer. Uh, Our current rate is 12.29%, and then lastly is just the change for each over the prior year. So um, we have seen a a decrease in our IMRF contribution rate um, and an uptick on the police and fire levy requirement. Um, Contribution required as a percentage of covered payroll. This is related to FY 2016 budget. Um, So for IMRF, we saw the employer rate is 12.29% for the city. Um, and that is in addition to the 4.5% that the employee is contributing. Um, but the city also contributes for IMRF employees to FICA for Social Security, 6.2%. So the total for IMRF is 18.49%. Police pension is 51.45%, and fire pension is 40.52%. So that's just taking the tax levy requirement divided by the covered payroll and calculating the percentage. I have to ask, and and this might not be the best time to ask the question, but have any of these three populations, municipal employees, police, or fire, um, do the employees express a desire to change from defined contribution to defined benefit where they would have more control over everything? They are defined benefit. I would not dare to speak for the employees, but I think in general, um, employees are very happy with defined benefit. They know what their benefit's going to be. They don't have to take the risk of investment losses. Yes, they have the potential for getting more, but um, they're risk averse and they rather just know what they're... Is that fair, Rob? Elizabeth, I can assure you that you are correct. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and, and a lot of this is that, you know, is negotiated in Springfield by the unions. So, you know, these, this is... Yeah, but that's not employees. And that, that's, no, I understand, but... That's, that's why the, I'm asking. Right, but I think they 
probably defer to their union leadership to uh, you know elect the people they want to get elected and then negotiate with those people. They have you have no as an employee, you have no essentially no risk with the defined benefit plan, and with a DC plan, you have a ton a of, of risk, mm -hmm. and that is the reason. Sure. And miss returns, but Qu okay. <laughs> Question. I mean, big picture wise, this is clearly unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Clearly. So, and, and Bob touched on a, a on a concept I was thinking of. Do the municipalities um, exculpate themselves from the liability by filing bankruptcy? Well, I'll leave that to Vic. Um, I can tell you that the recent decision in Detroit and also the recent issue in Stockton where the court said that even though the communities decided not to restructure their pensions as a part of their um, uh, restructuring, that that is clearly something they can do because they are to be treated no different than any other creditor. So now I'll let Vic give the legal opinion. Uh, well, as far as the federal bankruptcy law is concerned, there is a section for uh, municipal bankruptcy, and it does permit uh, the pensions as well as other uh, liabilities to be modified as par part of a restructure. Uh, there is a pretty serious question under the Illinois Constitution whether a municipality can file for bankruptcy, and that's uh, something that the governor has certainly uh, honed in as a possibility. Um, that I, I don't know that, that there certainly has not been any court that has made the determination in Illinois that it cannot, but there are various uh, constitutional analyses that would suggest that it can't. Well, uh, albeit we're in better shape than most, it seems like they're going to be dropping like flies. And you would think there'd be some <coughs> legislative reform on the horizon? No. Um, well, the. I think a lot of people are watching the um, challenge for this for the pension reform approved at the statewide plan. So those are the five main state plans um, to see how that um, constitutional question will be answered um, regarding benefits and promises to employees. So um, I know Illinois Municipal League pushes very hard for for reforms for pension. I agree. Lake Forest has very well-funded pension plans. So if Lake Forest is experiencing this kind of increase, you can imagine what the other um, less funded um, pension plans are going to face. Um, and they have an added um, issue, which we're going to see in a very short time period, which is that that 96-1495 Public Act also set aside requirements that if an employer does not meet its actuarially determined contribution, the state can divert revenues from the municipality to the pension plans. And so when that takes effect and that starts happening, then those employers, um, if not fully funded, will begin to lose general fund revenues, sales tax distributions, income tax, telecommunications distributions. So We're taking that away already? Well, that, yeah, that is um, separate and apart from this pension question. So that will really exacerbate uh, the problems for less funded pension plans. Are there maybe, <clears throat> I don't know how to ask the question. In, I know in Michigan there's more and more of the <clears throat> non-union private fire departments that are set up regionally that, aren't, uh, that are contracted by municipalities. And they're talking about police as well or just reverting to the county sheriff and not having municipal police in these areas, because things are moving faster in a bad direction in certain municipalities in Michigan, I'm told. Um, is there, with the, with the strength of the municipal unions, fire and, and police in particular, are there rules set up to prohibit municipalities from outsourcing police and fire and other life safety groups? Not that I'm suggesting it, but that it's definitely happening across the country. They, they pay a bill and they don't have a pension. Yeah, um, there was a small example of that toward, right toward the end of the Quinn uh, administration where 
the uh, and we were told about this along the way where uh, now the fire union has succeeded in getting staffing levels at the fire station level uh, subjected to collective bargaining, which has never been the case in the past. That was always a purely discretion on, uh, at the discretion shift, of the city. Shift minimums. Shift minimums, that kind of thing. And that's now Illinois state law. So that's now going to be negotiated the same way salaries and, uh, <coughs> and other benefits are negotiated. And, uh, you know, you have that taking place between the unions and the administrators in Springfield. All right. So. And I think... Uh, Alderman, I also defer to Vic, but I know that, for example, the village of Lincolnwood has a privatized fire department, but there have been laws put in place since then that make it very difficult. And I think that that's being challenged right now, I think in Riverside uh, or another community that was looking to privatize and the local union is challenging their ability to do that. So I think there's still some- Camel's nose is under the tent anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the only solution if you really consider what you're up against, right? If you're in a right. corner. Bob, oh, now for the fun slide. Yeah. <laughs> can I, Bob, can I just ask? <laughs> Does I this know, have a happy ending? <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> I know you've been talking about these issues for a long time, and, and um, um, not just in, in Lake Forest, but, but in the state, and, and have been working with our legislators and so on. I mean, do you get a sense of any traction being made on this as we, as we, you know, talk to, to our legislators in Springfield and talk about how concerned we are about things that we're required to do that we don't have control over and, you know, how worried we are? Are, are, are there a lot of people talking to them about how worried they are? Well, I think there are a lot of people. I think the real problem, though, is, is that they can't find their way out of the problem. Oh. And um, as Vic indicated, there is this language in the Illinois Constitution mm -hmm. that talks about um, that you cannot diminish or uh, impair the value or the benefits of the pension. And unfortunately, um, you know, when they made decisions over the last 20, 25 years, they didn't realize that when they increased benefits, for example, uh, that they couldn't scale those back. Their only ability to do so was under Tier 2. Uh, and that was the legislation in, in 2011 mm -hmm. that Elizabeth has talked about. The problem that we tried to explain to them uh, in 2011 was, well, that is good. That cannot be challenged as being unconstitutional. Um, it isn't going to take any immediate effect. It'll be 20 years before communities really see the benefit of the Tier 2. So they're quite now struggling with what do we do between now and 20 years from now? And there are no good answers. Um, and I understand the position of the unions, which is we're not gonna give up anything we've earned and we have, but if you just look at the math, the math doesn't work. And the only good news, I think for a community like Lake Forest is we're not gonna be the first one over the cliff. We're gonna watch a number of municipalities go over the cliff first and see what the state does to respond to that. Because um, you know, part of the challenge or part of the problem, I think that's also playing out in the court, is that um, until they pass this law in 2011, communities could basically say, okay, we have this obligation, but we're just not gonna fund it. And so we will continue to go deeper and deeper. Now in 2016, that's gonna change but the reality is if you're diverting these benefits, and in some cases, they don't even get as much from the state as to what they owe in their obligation. So I think you're, you're potentially gonna see some other games. And, and I know, and I won't say it publicly on TV, there are some mayors of some large cities that have been looking for bankruptcy protection because they know the only option is you know, a 20% increase in property taxes, and that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Do, is there currently um, law in place that requires uh, that a mun municipality go to referendum in order to make a decision to privatize police or fire services? Or is that something that is being discussed? I, I remember reading about it, but I can't remember if it's reality or potential. Yeah, that is something that's on the table right now, uh, whether it's privatize or consolidate or diminish their uh, their fire service that they would have to go to referendum. Yeah. I don't believe that that's passed as of this time. I think it's currently 
in committee and, and being discussed, but it is one of those uh, current legislative proposals that municipalities are trying to fight. Mm. Want to talk so about accounting for a minute? It can't get worse. It can. <laughs> um, Governmental Accounting Standards Board sets out generally accepted accounting principles um, requiring the city to make certain changes to its accounting and financial reporting. Statement 67 and 68. Um, are going to be on your radar for about a year and a half. Um, GASB 67 will be effective for the city's April 30th, 2015 financials. Um, it is related to the pension plan. So because police and fire is a single employer plan, uh, we fall under GASB 67 for those two plans and it revises disclosures uh, in the notes to the financial statements for those two plans. Um, GASB 68 is the much more significant pronouncement. It will be effective for the city's April 30th, 2016 financials. And what it does is it requires employers to put the net pen pension liability uh, as a liability on their financial statements um, where it's previously simply been disclosed in the notes to financial statements. So in the consolidated financial statements, that unfunded liability of the pension plans will actually be reported and significantly reduce the net assets of the municipalities. Um, we have undertaken a couple different um, changes in the actuarial evaluation to try to mitigate some of the impact of GASB 67 and 68. So for the actuarial evaluation 43013 for police and fire, we adjusted the mortality table. So we increased, uh, we were reflective of longer longevity, um, people living longer, receiving a pension for a longer period of time. That significantly increased the accrued liability, reduced our funded ratio. For 43014, also on fire police, we reduced the interest rate assumption from 7.5 to 7%. Um, for a few years, the city was levying based on 7%, but reporting in the financials based on 7.5%. Um, and so we just went ahead and made the change to make it 7% across the board um, to try to get that discount rate and assumed rate closer um, and minimize the impact. For 43015 this year, the police and fire actuarial, um, there will be additional changes in the actuarial assumptions um, that will also um, begin to mitigate the impact. A lot of them are less, um, less impacting. There's some of the uh, assumed rates of um, retirement and those kind of things. So there are more obscure assumptions than kind of the interest rate assumption and the salary assumption that you hear more about, but it will impact uh, the numbers. A question on that. If, <clears throat> if the unfunded part of our, <clears throat> our pension plan, we have to pay because we have to pay 7% on that unfunded portion, right? Um, it's it's embedded in the embedded, evaluation. Either way, it's, yes. it's growing yes. by seven percent right. the debt, mm -hmm. and we can bond at what rate right now? And why don't we bond that out? I'm not suggesting. I'm asking why that wouldn't happen. And we're all and later in the meeting, we're going to be giving away ten million dollars in bond cap to another community, and paying the difference to the pension plan. And why aren't these things being wrapped up together? Um, when you have that kind of transaction, it has to be a taxable bond. You don't get tax exempt status for that type of bond. Um, and I would say that some, some municipalities have used that mechanism and paid the price for it. Um, so it is a philosophy. It is a, an approach that people can take. Um, but it's risky. But it's risky. Well, you're essentially borrowing money tax, on a taxable basis to pay your pension plan. So you're really just moving the liability the bond from fixed over time. Well, you might issue a fixed rate bond, but you're the point is you're just moving the liability from one place to another. At a lower rate, and you're rate. saying it's at a lower rate, which is the argument. The problem is that it it's uh, you you use the analogy of a of a drug addict before. That's what's happened to the cities that have done it, and by and large, they've used up it's too easy. Cap. They use up their bonding <coughs> capacity, and it usually has. And, and Elizabeth, please verify this, but I believe it's had a very negative effect on their credit ratings. Yeah, it's not very popular at the rating 
pages. So, okay. and, Again, and I, I and we just, should, I was just, it was a question. No, 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 it I is mean. very valid. And it is a mechanism that a number of employers have used. Um, Including and, the state of Illinois. Yeah. Yes, the state and of I Illinois think the city of Chicago, issue. too, if I remember correctly. Elizabeth, I, I've got a question here. And I, I feel like I'm missing something, and it's probably because I'm missing something. But um, is it such a bad thing to have to record our pension liability? I mean, if, for it to be sort of in front of us, front and center, for it to be on our financial reports, front and center, it is a liability. It is something that we have to be <coughs> mindful of. So. Why are we, I guess I'm looking, you know, we're, we're being, we're talking about m mitigation with these, with, these, uh, with these regulations, but it seems to me to have them front and center, which I think is something that I admire about the way this city has managed these issues, that it has been front and center, it has looked at them directly, but I think we all need to understand that, and I think increasingly our constituents need to understand this is what we spend a huge amount of time talking about, worrying about, looking for solutions for, and it seems like having it absolutely in front of us is not is not a bad thing, but am I wrong? I, no, I absolutely <laughs> agree with you. There, it It is a liability. And, and again, it's only going on the front consolidated statements, which is where uh, long-term liabilities like debt are also reported. Um, but it, there is going to be a shock when those go on financial statements and people see their net, um, <clears throat> net assets drop by $30 million plus. Um, and it's going to be everybody. Everybody's in it at the same time. That reset, that adjustment's going to occur for everybody. Um, but, but it will be significant. But isn't it also the precursor to assuming that that liability is going to be funded out of general funds, not just, isn't that what you were referring to before? Where the state has the ability to, oh. to take, this is basically saying that, isn't it? Um, it it's a little bit different. Um, because it's two different entities. I mean, you've got the state statute kind of forcing funding on employers, which is not necessarily a bad thing either. But this is more from a financial reporting standpoint in the, in the financial statement showing this as a liability on the financials where it's not been before. But And just to try to put a number around that, could you go back to page 9? And I would just... Uh, alert you that will not be the number right so the calculation is very different um, and for one thing IMRF what I do um, like is that under GASB 68 IMRF can no longer pull the retired 100% piece away from the employer it now has to be blended so all all IMRF employees currently receiving a pension benefit for the city of Lake Forest are sitting in this 100% funded plan over here. And now that piece that is Lake Forest will now be blended with what you see here. Um, so uh, we may find on IMRF with GASB 68, we're very close to 100%, um, which won't be a bad thing. We don't have the benefit of that in police and fire because the retirees are there too um, already. So, and, and Hopefully, I think we're running out of time, so I try to bring this to a close. A <laughs> um, couple of things, though, that everybody should understand. Number one, we are in great shape financially. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a AAA bond rating that was just reaffirmed. This change in accounting uh, statements will not have an effect on our rating because the rating agencies have always been aware of this liability, and they've always looked at it, they've always considered it, and they look at our funding levels, and they say, you guys are in great shape. So it may not look great to us, because we're used to having everything absolutely perfect. Um, and some of these things are not really within our control, but on a relative basis, we are standing very, very tall right now. And um, you know, these are things that are going to have to be dealt with, and it's going to have consequences for us. But as Bob pointed out before, the consequences for Lake Forest will be significantly minimized by our strength going into this process. And uh, there are. Uh, there are a lot of communities around the state of Illinois that are going to have serious, serious problems very quickly. Uh, that won't be us. So uh, while all the gloom and doom, it's a, it's a bad situation at the state level, and it's frustrating that we don't control a lot of these decisions uh, that affect, and that ultimately these things are going to have, at least some portion is going to fall on us. There's almost no doubt about it. So. Um, 
but you know people shouldn't go home thinking or if you're out there watching uh, you shouldn't go home thinking that this is you know the end of the world for Lake Forest it's not uh, it'll be dealt with and uh, you know we all may have to chip in a little bit but uh, it, it, it'll be okay question is it conceivable that when GASB 68 kicks in next year that there will immediately be other municipalities that go negative on their net worth as a result of the new reporting? Yes, it's absolutely. Very possible. Some of them were already there, you know, just barely. I mean, we've got some neighbors around here. So who, it's going to bring it all to a head that much sooner. They're going to have negative net assets, yeah. So, okay. Um, I, we've got two more things that I think we can two or three more things we can cover quickly and still get through our agenda. Um, the, um, uh, there's a, a policy about fund balance reserves that uh, in light of the discussion we just had, uh, the staff is recommending that we take a more conservative approach than we are generally permitted. So I think I'll let Elizabeth quickly run through that. Okay. Um, this question came out of the March 9th budget discussion, um, and so we're just bringing it back uh, for consideration. The current, our fiscal policy establishes fund balance targets by fund and by type of fund. The general fund is the primary operating fund of the city, so it is the one we focus the most on. The current target is 25% of annual revenue plus the accrued sick and vacation liability. Um, we also exclude from that any assigned fund balances where there's amounts in fund balance, but they're designated for some particular purpose. Um, this shows a graph of the target versus the actual um, since FY07. So um, one question was how did we get the substantial reserves that we have, which are over our target currently. And most of that's occurred in the last few years. You can see that we, up through about FY13, the actual fund balance was very close to the target. And in FY14, we started to see a bump up. For FY15, I have both the budget and the year end estimate here. So you can see that um, the target is relatively the same, but we do project ending the year better than we anticipated in the budget. And then this is the impact of the FY16 budget. Um, so we have over time accumulated um, general fund reserves beyond the target. Um, some of the recommendations based on the conversation on March 9th was to, is to increase the fund balance target in the general fund to 35% of revenues from 25 and to still include the sick and vacation liability. Um, and this is, um, would not affect current fund balance reserves because the city is over 50%, so you're at the 35% now. But it does provide an additional buffer, especially given the state's budget situation. Um, and that is a proposed change in the city's fiscal policy for consideration this evening. A second item that was raised on March 9th is that eventually the city will have to replace its current financial system. Um, HT has been used since 1996. Um, it is fairly antiquated. It is included in the five-year capital improvement plan. Um, it's just a matter of when that will um, be mandated by the software vendor. Um, so the recommendation is to assign 1.2 million of fund balance for that future replacement, which would take away the issue of finding funding when it's time to replace the system. And so that recommendation um, related to the fiscal policy, there's two recommended changes to the fiscal policy for FY16. One is to adjust the fund balance target from 25 to 35% in the general fund. The second is to add reference to a pension funding policy. This is a GASB 67 and 68 issue uh, where the auditors are looking for um, city councils to have affirmed the assumptions that you're making in your actuarial evaluation and to do that officially rather than me telling the actuary what to put in the actuary evaluation, this is the city council kind of setting out what that is. And so our plan would be to um, reference, in, reference it in the fiscal policy now, but to bring that back to the finance committee in July, just reflecting current practice. So would not, we don't anticipate any significant policy changes, um, but just to reiterate, especially uh, the city council's commitment to, to differ from the current legislation. 
Um, that is too small to see, but what I was trying to do was show the five-year fund balance forecast in the general fund with the impacts of these changes. These are the, this is the fund balance that you've seen in the five-year forecast that we've been talking about. What I did in yellow here was non-spendable fund balance is an amount that's on our balance sheet that's reported as non-spendable in our audit. We don't typically take it out of our five-year forecast, but I thought it was important for this discussion. And this is made up primarily of long-term receivables. It's the Ragdale loan of one and a half million and a, and a multi-year uh, interfund loan between the water fund and the general fund. So those receivable balance aren't, aren't expected to be available for expenditure the next year, so it's set aside. So I just pulled that number out. Then the 1.2 million for the assigned fund balance related to the financial system. And then on this line, I've adjusted the fund balance target to 35% from 25% to show the change there. The important thing is that in the next few years, even with those changes, fund balance reserves are still beyond the target. So, um, you know, that would tell you kind of what the effect would be on the five-year forecast of the recommendations. Elizabeth, at some point in time, can we get a line itemization of that $1.2 million for the financial system? It just is such an enormous amount of money. I'd like to know, what do you get for that? It doesn't. Um, really, we don't have a line item because we haven't gone out to RFP for it. So it's, but is it software and computer hardware? It would be probably some hardware, some servers, some back-end infrastructure, but this is all the financial systems plus building, community okay. development. So it's your water billing, your payroll, your general ledger, your budget systems, your building permit system, accounts receivable. It's all those components. And, and that was an estimate that um, the city's IT consultant had in the five-year plan a few years ago, and we've just left the number at their estimate. Is that custom written for us, or is it an off-the-shelf? It would depend. Um, the city would end up developing a list of specifications <clears throat> and go out to RFP and probably have a lot of options with a very wide range of cost. And until we tested the market, we wouldn't really have a good number. It somewhat sounds like an ERP system. It is an ERP system, yeah. I'm sorry, enterprise. Resource planning. Resource. Thank you. <laughs> it could be too high, um, and unfortunately it could be too low. It really depended on the market at any given time. And I would say that um, our current plan is to use HTE as long as we can. It's functional, it's just that eventually it's, a, it's not the first tier product of our software vendor, and eventually they're going to quit supporting it. So that would be the time at which we would need to replace it. But if it's not broke, why fix it? And how much support does it need if it's been in place since 1996? Well, because 20 we pay, years? Um, actually on your council agenda this evening is the annual contract for maintenance of HTE. And so we have to pay a maintenance fee to get the updates that are required to the software each year. Thank you. Is there a subscription-based offering uh, that we would potentially consider as part of a replacement so that we pay as you go as opposed to buying the software yes. and installing that? The cloud, cloud what based we have started support. doing is we're in the process of the phone system right now, the same that we did with the parks and recreation software replacement. We encouraged vendors to submit both on-premise as well as hosted solutions so that we could compare the costs. Okay, um, other business, uh, each of us received, a, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, so um, really the only action requested of the committee this evening is to approve the recommended changes to the fiscal policy only because they will be incorporated in the budget document you consider on May 4th. So that would be the two um, redlined revisions in your packet that take general fund from 25 to 35 and reference the pension funding policy. Is this something we're voting on, or is this uh, something that's going to get voted on at the city council meeting? Um, well, I think it would be council. We need a consensus of the council right now, or, or the finance committee. I'm sorry to pass it on to the council. Okay. Um, so is a consensus a vote? <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> 
I mean, I, any, are there objections? I guess that's the best way to. No. Okay, so it is the sense of the finance committee that uh, the city council should accept these recommendations from the staff. Okay. Uh, moving on to the last couple of housekeeping items, everybody received a copy of the flash report. Uh, it has been modified according to requests that we made at our March 9th meeting. So everybody should take a look at that and see if they find it to be clearer and easier to follow. Um, I thought it was a good step in the right direction, personally, but uh, there may be further improvements that we can keep making. Um, everybody received a list of what are being euphemistically referred to in Springfield as sweeps. Uh, the sweeps, quote unquote, are simply reallocations of budget from things like the road program, uh, $250 million from the road fund uh, being reallocated to pay for uh, general state purposes. So they're moving specifically, what they've done is they've got a whole list and we've all been given a copy of this list <coughs> of $1.2 billion worth of pre previously designated state funds that are being pulled from the designations that were made at, at, when the budget was passed and reallocated to the general fund. Um, the two most notable that I saw were this, I mentioned the two, two, $250 million from the state road fund to general purposes, i.e. not roads, uh, and I think it was $100 million from the state uh, allocation of income taxes to the cities. So uh, that's, that's one of the things that's causing some of the angst you all were hearing tonight. Uh, that's a one-time move. That doesn't fix the underlying issues. It's just, they're just taking money from one part of the budget and putting it into the general fund. Um, uh, and then there were a few budget follow-up items uh, that we had uh, asked about at our March 9th meeting, uh, which we can quickly refer to. Uh, they were, uh, and, and there's a, well, I, I just, I would refer all the, uh, all the city council members to this chart, which shows when we can expect to see some of these follow-up items come through. So, uh, any other observations, questions, thoughts before we adjourn? And all right, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. We'll begin the city council meeting uh, in approximately five minutes or twelve minutes to eight.